about 7 p.m. Central Time last night, Kansas released the response to the notice of allegations issued by the NCAA in September, and the response was forceful. Kansas is battling every allegation. They mostly involved the relationship between head coach Bill Self and assistant Curtis Townsend with Adidas representatives who had contact and in some cases exchanged money with the parents or guardians of prospects. KU beat writer Jesse Newell helps us make sense of the response on Sports Beat KC, the Kansas City Star's daily sports podcast. It's Friday, March 6th, and I'm Blair Kirkhoff. After a break, college basketball remains the topic, but we'll hear a celebration and its aftermath. The KC Ruse women's team, you knew them as UMKC before the rebranding this year, defeated Utah Valley on Thursday night, giving the Kangaroos the outright Western Athletic Conference championship. How big is that? It's the first basketball title for the men's or women's program in 33 years of Division I affiliation. The basketball programs have been a member of a conference since 1994. You'll hear from third-year head coach J.C. Hoyt and players Awal Ejak and Erica Mattingly talk about winning the championship. But first, here's Jesse Newell on KU. Jesse is here, and we're here, and we're going to talk about the, the Kansas response to the, the NCAA allegations uh, that were released on Thursday about 7 p.m., a little bit later than, than I thought that was going to happen. We talked about it the previous day after the, the Kansas victory over TCU that clinched the at least a share of the Big 12 title. But anyway, they're out, and it took a while to digest. I think we're still trying to digest everything when it's – uh, as, as long a document as this is, over 300 pages. But Jesse, how about to, to lead it off? Is there a um, is there an overriding theme to uh, what you read? Yeah, I think there is, Blair. And you know, it's difficult, like you said, because you've got multiple lawyers, you've got multiple sides of the story, you've got you know KU attorneys putting together one document, you've got self attorneys putting together another document, you've got Curtis Townsend's attorneys putting together. Another document, so you sort of have a lot of different people saying different things, but there are kind of some general overtones to what KU was trying to get across here. And I think the number one thing that kind of kept jumping out to me and kind of remains a central part of this entire process is KU basically trying to assert that the Adidas representatives mentioned here and also former coach Larry Brown should not be considered boosters of the school. And if you look at sort of the NCAA's claims against Kansas, the allegations, almost all of it falls at the feet of that, you know, that assertion that those parties should be linked to Kansas as boosters, and that's the reason that KU should be punished. And so you see a lot of lawyers, a lot of legal leads kind of poking holes at this, basically saying, hey, look, KU had an arm's length, that's their words, arm's length, um, relationship with Adidas and the Adidas representatives. And if potentially the NCAA finds that these sort of parties can be considered boosters, what KU is saying is that, well, listen, these shoe apparel companies, they deal with some of the grassroots teams. They deal with some of the high school tournaments that are out there. And all of a sudden you have kind of this whole Pandora's box of people that might start to be ineligible or you have questions about because this has not really ever been tried before by the NCAA to say that these sorts of representatives can be considered boosters of school. So I think that's the number one thing, the overriding theme. Again, we can, when there's 300 pages of documents, there's lots of arguments being made. But I think that was one that kind of kept coming up over and over and over again. And um, while it is, it seems to be a pretty good legal argument, uh, I'm not sure how much it's going to play with the NCAA and the enforcement and infractions process just because, um, I kind of because what we've talked about before, Blair, when it comes to the situation, which is uh, the way it's been described to me by the people that are in the know is that the NCAA is more like a homeowners association than it is a court of law. And so um, while lawyers getting involved is fine, and that's what happens in these processes, kind of coming out and explaining why legally X, Y, and Z shouldn't be able to be to happen is a little bit different when you're doing this um, to a homeowners association rather than a judge and a jury. So. Um, that's kind of where KU is standing at this point. That's why KU probably still will have some punishments coming, even with if they have some legal ground to stand on, because this is not a legal case. This is an NCAA case. And I think the burden of proof there is very much different than it would be if this was in front of a different party or in a courtroom, as we would say. Uh, this is not going to be that. 
Right, and to your um, to your idea that Kansas is um, asserting that the, that um, that the NCAA is just simply wrong in characterizing the relationships. The the the, the, the line that I pulled out was Kansas describing what the NCAA is doing as novel theories that put novel theories put forward that would dramatically change the college sports landscape. And that's, that's exactly what you talked about that, you know, if, um, you know, if, if boosters, if, if the types of things that have been alleged here with Adidas representatives dealing with, you know, the guardians or parents of Billy Preston, Sylvia De Souza, and even Deandre Ayton and Zion Williamson, um, if, if that's considered, a you know if, if Kansas is held the Kansas argument is if the school is held responsible for that then then who isn't among the you know the, the major programs who who doesn't do that who who isn't doing that and I don't know if that's the if that's where you want to um, that's where they're making their legal legal argument or, or at least their response we'll we'll see how far that goes and and you're you're um, Comparison to a homes association is dead on. I mean, that's what the NCAA is. It's it's the collection and the collective ideas of all of its members, not the, you know, not just the, you know, Mark Emmert uh, in, in, in the buck stops here in Indianapolis. It's not that way. It's it's the ideas of um, of everybody, and that's of course what a homes association tries to do as well. So, um, how about if we took a couple of the specific examples of the, the players, because the, the covered in the 300 pages, Kansas tries to specifically d- defend itself in the in the recruiting of De Souza and, and the others. But let's start there. What what does Kansas say, or how do they respond to the you know the money that exchanged hands? They don't dispute the money exchanged hands between uh, Adidas and and Guardian of of, uh, of De Souza. But how do, how does Kansas explain it? Yeah, and, and actually, I mean, these are some of the kind of the nitty gritty details that might be some of the strongest part of Kansas' case, to be completely honest with you. Um, at least when it comes to Sylvia de Sosa, there was sort of a fascinating stretch in one of the documents where they talked about, um, this, I'm sorry, because so we have, there's a lot of characters here. We have TJ Gasnola, Adidas representative. We have Fenny right. Falmain, who was the guardian of Sylvia de Sosa, who received $2,500 cash. And there's kind of a, a text message type of exchange that they had over the WhatsApp app on their phone, basically. And it kind of spells out um, pretty well that, like, TJ sent the money to Falmain to say, hey, this is money for online classes. And then he basically says, like, hey, I don't need money for online classes. The online classes are free. And TJ says, well, I'm not taking the money back, so do what you want with it, basically. And so, I mean, it's it's the sort of thing I don't think we've seen before and the evidence we haven't heard before that's kind of buried in this big document, but that's actually pretty good for Kansas's case. You know what I mean? Like if they want to say that, Hey, they had nothing to do with the money exchanging hands and that um, obviously um, this was TJ Gasnola working on his own. I mean, that all kind of seems to point in that same direction. And for Billy Preston, one particular interesting detail that was in there is that um, KU's lawyers are making the assertion that, Bill Self is the one that self-reported Billy Preston and his family potentially getting paid by T.J. Gasnola. And so they make that claim in there that um, that's part of what happened, um, you know, in this process. And again, I mean, uh, we'll see what happens over time. But but that sort of thing saying that, hey, Bill Self is the one that kind of was the whistleblower on this whole thing sort of would, again, go to their side of saying that uh, KU was not trying to um, have these payments happen. Now, Again, there's a lot to go in there, and, and I think we, we kind of have to keep level heads about all this and, and try to think of this in big picture scenario and, and kind of all these things happening at once because I can mention that there's some good evidence for Kansas in that document while also pointing out that part of the 77-page document from self-lawyers go into what we should interpret from T.J. Gasnola when he uses the word lol in a text, LOL, laugh out loud. So. I mean, a lot of us are wasting our time here by coming up with explanations for this and then having to read through things like this and kind of points out sort of the ridiculousness of this whole process that, that lawyers are making a lot, a lot of money to uh, to tell us exactly what the word lol means in the context of uh, text messages between <laughs> TJ Gasnola and Bill Self. Um, but but I, I think going back to the homeowners association thing, Blair, 
you know, this is sort of where I stand on it uh, and, and kind of how I, 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 I'm trying to view it here. You mentioned the Homeowner Association. So the NCAA is something that all these schools decide upon and sign up for. And if you don't like the NCAA's rules, you don't have to sign up with them. It's the same thing as a homeowner's association. You know, I mean, if, if you don't want to cut your grass every week, you don't cut, you know, don't sign up for the homeowner's association. Go buy a house in a different district, that sort of thing. So while, again, I think the lawyers did a good job here of spelling out potentially why a lot of these things don't appear as they seem in the trial and maybe some of this evidence shouldn't be taken at face value in the trial. I think there's still, it's really difficult for Kansas because, again, kind of going back to the homeowner association thing, if we read the we good text, we read the, hey, I've, I've taken care of you other than beyond the text, all those sorts of things. I mean, Sam Mellinger wrote a good piece on this in the Kansas State. So I encourage people to check out. Like, if you read this with a reasonable mind, I think you come to the conclusion that Bill Self at least knew kind of what was happening here with T.J. Gasnola and that he was going to these recruits. And, again, KU fans will argue one way. Other team fans will argue the other way. I think the bottom line is it's – and then I said this to somebody earlier, it's sort of like a homeowners association. It sure looks like Kansas didn't cut its grass for a couple months. You know what I mean? And so if you're the homeowners association, you, you probably have a right to do something about that and punish the party involved. And so, again, this is not a trial. This is not going to court. This is not going to have a judge and a jury. And so the standard for the NCAA to, to bring sanctions upon Kansas for what appears here, again, appears with reasonable minds that builds up probably knew what was happening in the situation with T.J. Gasnola, it seems like Kansas still will probably have some sort of punishment levied against them. And while all these legal arguments are great, and they're great in front of juries and judges and lawyers, um, they just don't stand as much in the NCAA because the NCAA doesn't have that same sort of standard it has to reach. So I think that's kind of where I, I stand with this whole thing. While, while some of these things make a lot of sense and while some of these things are good legal arguments, it might just not play that way in an NCAA type of court of law, which just is not quite the same thing as uh, what a lot of these lawyers are used to, which is, hey, innocent until proven guilty. That, that's not the way that the NCAA has to work. So Kansas has been um, alleged to have committed five level one violations in, in men's basketball, and level one violations are deemed the most serious of the, you know, of the crimes of, um, you know, of college sports. So if, um, if 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 the, if it plays out, if the, if the penalties play out, uh, the the punishment would be pretty severe. It could could be. And and um, what, what are some things that could happen to Kansas if um, if the NCAA uh, comes back and really doesn't you know, doesn't accept Kansas's response and and and, and, and levies the full punishment for KU? Well, there's a lot and. You know, it, we're kind of in uncharted waters here, Blair, because with the five level ones, I mean, level ones carry the most severe sanctions, and Kansas has five of them, and including the lack of institutional control charge. So we're not just talking about, you know, one lane that you're looking at the NCAA rule book for. We're talking about all sorts of things. And then obviously, um, you know, Bill Self having potential things thrown at him as well. So, yeah, I mean, we could be talking, obviously, postseason ban. Lots of scholarships, probation. Um, for Bill Self, it could be a show cause, which basically is uh, sort of like a de facto NCAA suspension. Basically, you can't get hired unless you can um, submit to the NCAA reasonings for having a coach being part of your program, and that doesn't seem like a very good process to have to go through to keep guys your coach. He obviously could be suspended for an extended period of time. We saw that with Jim Beheim a few years ago when he sat out nine games, but with even more level one violations, you know, Bill Self potentially could be longer than that. So, yeah, I mean, the, the potential there is is anything really, and and because this case is sort of doesn't have a parallel, we, we don't really know how far or how far reaching the NCAA might want to go with this, or the enforcement, you know, the enforcement infractions committee will want to go with this sort of thing. So, um, yeah, it's it's all out there, and I think at the end of the day. You know, it's it's difficult to try to understand exactly or know exactly what might happen because there are so many range of outcomes and there are it's almost like the you know the the weather you know hey what's it going to do in 22 days well it's, we don't know I mean we got a guess of what it does and we have a guess of what it's done in 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 March and other years but you know it, there's so many factors at play that 
um, that you could see where potentially KU might not be punished as severely, and you could see where the NCAA was embarrassed in this whole thing and, and doesn't take KU's word and, and really puts the hammer down on them because they've tried to make Kansas an example in this whole thing, it sure seems like. So um, all those things are on the table, and obviously for KU and the basketball program, I mean, they've made – we talked about on the podcast the other day, they've made whatever it is, 31 or so straight NCAA tournament yeah. appearances. Um, everyone, been... everyone since the last time they were <laughs> ineligible, and that was the <laughs> 1989 season after they defended the national championship of 88. Yeah, so uh, you know they, that's obviously in jeopardy. Um, I mean, from a big picture perspective, um, it, Listen, these are, I mean, I guess those are short-term things. You know, you miss the tournament a year, you, you, your doctor's scholarship or two. I mean, those are short-term things. I guess maybe the, the bigger question that always is looming out there is Bill Self. You know, if he gets, let's say, and this is all hypothetical here, let's say he gets a nine-game suspension and KU gets a one-year postseason ban. Um, let's say that's what the final verdict is, and we learn that late summer. I think Bill Self wants to stay at Kansas. I think he likes it here. I think that he likes what he has going here. And if that really was the punishment and, and that within a year, KU would be done with all of this, I think he'd sign up for it. And, again, that's my personal belief that he would be fine just taking the punishment, moving on, and immediately going out and being able to recruit and saying, hey, if you come to Kansas, none of this stuff will impact you. And immediately that cloud has lifted and it is gone from the program. But, again, he could get a show cause. If it's a show cause, he basically can't coach in college, and he'll be gone. And so maybe the biggest picture ramification of this whole thing is that for KU, basketball has been so important for such a long time, and they haven't been able to turn around football, and they're still struggling to turn around football. If Bill Self were to leave because he got a two-year NCAA suspension or because KU got a four-year postseason ban or whatever the case may be, um, Bill Self is probably the biggest domino here because KU cannot last one or two years. Of, of struggling through whatever they have to go through. But but can KU outlast losing a Hall of Fame coach and having to replace him and figuring out where the program goes when there are sanctions on top of that? That's probably the overwhelming question that is going to be answered here in the next few months. And that's probably the biggest question that KU faces here uh, with all these penalties that are coming down. That's the thing that probably could impact them the most. In terms of a rough timetable, the, the NCAA has 60 days to reply to the Kansas response. And then, and then there'll be a hearing uh, set before the Committee of Infractions, and that would probably be after the NCAA response to KU. That'd probably be another six to eight weeks, up, you know, up to two months later. So I, I think you're right about the the idea of late sum, summer, late summer, going maybe going into the following season when um, when we'll get the um the response the, the committee of infractions meeting where Kansas would find out what if any penalties were applied and I'll tell you what Jesse even at that point I'm not sure Kansas would be finished um arguing its case and I think uh, it was a story that Gary Bedore wrote a year or so ago where he quoted Jay Billis suggesting that um Kansas might want to you know pursue it even further if if um you know if they're found to have you know, if, if they get some of the more severe penalties or found to have committed to penalties that they believe just are, you know, are, are not, uh, did not happen. So we'll, we'll have to see yeah. about that. That's, that's yeah, down and, the road. And two point, two points on that Blair. Um, I, I agree with you because again, a lot of these arguments that KU is making here is that the NCAA is overstepping its bounds. And again, the NCAA doesn't have to accept that, but maybe a federal court would agree with that. And so that's a potential option KU can take. The problem with taking it there is exactly what I talked about with the cloud that hangs over the program. So um, if there are sanctions against KU and you want to appeal this thing to a higher court, a higher authority, it's going to take years. I mean, we're talking about a process that is going to not only cost you financially and lawyer fees and continuing to do this, but Bill Self can't go recruit them, you know what I mean, or whoever the coach is at Kansas. It's very difficult when this thing just kind of continually hangs over you and will not go away. And so that's what I, I talked about earlier. I think Phil Self, in his perfect world, you know, obviously he doesn't want to get punished and helps that KU wins its in simple case. But in a perfect world, if he got a short suspension and KU got a one-year postseason ban, I mean, that's something KU could live with because the future would be bright. The sun would be coming out very soon. You know what I mean? And then all this, you, you could pay the punishment for your crime and all of it would, you know, you'd be hurt reputation-wise, but you could move forward with a very certain future. If they took this to another court, 
that just really muddies things up. And again, it would it would be a process that would just continually drag the program and continue to be with it. So I think if KU really had its say here, they want this thing to for them to hopefully not have a severe punishment and then just serve it and be done with it. But um, yeah, that's an option. Absolutely. Jay Billis is, is right. You know, that's an option to say the MCLA overstepped the bounds and we're going to take it to a higher court up here to prove that sort of thing. If that happens, this whole thing just won't go away for Kansas. And I think that's probably the main goal here is to try to just make it go away. Okay, Jesse, I really appreciate you um, sharing your knowledge on this. And you're on your way to Lubbock for the, the season finale. Okay, you take on Texas Tech. And then next week, of course, is the Big 12 tournament. So safe travels, and we will see you back in town next week. Sounds good, Blair. Hey, it's Blair. Hey, we have a special subscription offer for Sportsbeat KC listeners. Unlimited digital access to the Kansas City Stars award-winning sports coverage. Sign up now for one year of Sports Pass for access to all the sports news, features, and columns we have to offer. And it's only $30. That's a 40% savings off our regular rate. For your convenience, your subscription will automatically renew after the initial term at $50 unless you tell us to cancel. A lot of subscription services won't tell you that. They'll just sneak it on there. We just told you. Your subscription helps support the sports coverage of KansasCity.com and the Kansas City Star. Please visit KansasCity.com slash SportsBeatKC offer to get this special offer. And as always, thanks for listening. Here's what the final few seconds of a conference championship victory sounds like. After that, you'll hear from Casey Roos coach J.C. Hoyt and players Awal Ajak and Erica Mattingly. Thank you for being here. Uh, we've got something really special, as you guys got to see tonight. And um, this is something that um, we're just so proud of. It, it, it's something that is incredibly hard to do, to be the first to do anything. Um, and the vision that we had and our, our team bought into way back even when they were being recruited, um, it, this has been a part of it all along. Um, we actually practiced this, didn't yeah. we? Yes. We practiced having a press conference, being yes. conference champions. Um, and so to, to be here and have it be our reality now, uh, I'm just incredibly proud of our players. Um, I have an amazing coaching staff. We have awesome fans, awesome administration. Um, I think this is just um, a, a monumental mark for our program, um, but also our entire athletic department. Did you practice the net cutting? <laughs> Believe it or not, we did. We did. Um, <laughs> yes, we did. Um, but you couldn't really tell today because uh, everyone kind of forgot what that <laughs> looked like. So, yeah. <laughs> Again, it goes back to it's never been done. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, this, is not, um, this is not KU men's basketball where players come in and they just expect to do that and they know what that looks like. I mean, it, it, that's the hard part of our jobs is we're trying to teach our players – Guys, this this is how it feels, and, and I think that was the biggest thing in practicing is wanting them to get a sense of how that feels. And um, we we do it a lot. I mean, we in the off season we probably did what maybe three or four times of it. Um, but I th- I think if you can get a taste of that and the feeling, um, and, and it's never going to be simulated, you know, to be the actual feeling. But if you can just get a taste of that, then it makes you hungry to do whatever it takes to actually get to feel it in real life. Um, so we're just, we're, uh, you know, I, I'm a big uh, vision casting person and um, just really believe that you've got to see it and believe it in order to achieve it. So how did it feel? <laughs> There's, how no it feel? <laughs> There's no words. There's no words. I mean, this is what we envisioned since being recruited by Coach JC. So it feels, I mean, it feels amazing. I think to piggyback off that, she's right, it feels amazing. And I think just to do it to our, our senior year and just being able to say that we did it before we were able to leave college is 10 times better and a, and a way better feeling than anything. So, yeah, like she said, it's an amazing feeling, and our team played really good tonight. So, 
you guys find yourself looking at mock brackets? <laughs> <laughs> or do you try to keep them away from that as much as you can? Um, you know what? We, we expect to be there. So yes, the answer is yes. And we're not going to shy away from that. Um, a wall's been talking about Baylor. <laughs> That's been one of the mock brackets. And, um, you know, it's, yeah, I, I think that goes into, you know, what we've been saying about just our vision. And um, so, yes, we, we would be lying if we said that we have it. <laughs> That'll do it for this week on Sports Beat KC, the Stars Daily Sports Podcast. I hope you enjoyed our episodes and continue to support this endeavor. Please leave a comment or a like where you can. It helps. Thanks to everybody who had a hand in putting together the show. Among them, producers Derek Donovan, Savannah Smith, Randy Mason, Beth Welsh, Jeff Rosen, and Chris Fickett. And thanks to Jesse Newell for bringing his KU hoop knowledge to the program. We'll be back on Monday to begin another week of Sports Beat KC, where we talk sports in Kansas City every day.